image. They then soon added static images to that. That was the World Wide Web as it was originally thought of. There's been a lot of talk in the last five years about Web 2.0. We think of that as the age of web apps, where there's these things called JavaScripts that run on websites. When you log on, it's not just a static lot of text and an image. It actually does things. You interact with it. So that's where we are now, um, the Web 2.0. But what's coming is Web 3.0. People don't like that term, but it really is the next generation where there's going to be built-in communications along with all of the above. So that means that, in fact, your browser is going to become your means of communication. It's going to become everything. Your way of accessing information, your way of talking to people, and it's basically going to replace the, the telephone as well, uh, communication means. So talking about the home, uh, we heard the, the mayor say that he, he wired up his phone with CBUS, his home with CBUS, which was uh, certainly very innovative. Um, I've just done a CBUS project at work and it was very complex, so I, I admire his tenacity. Um, so what, what have you got in your home in the future? Um, computers, printers, scanners, network detached storage devices like that one shown there, uh, which I have at home, which is now out of date. It's only five terabytes gig. And apparently for a quarter of the price you can buy one that's 10 terabytes now. TVs, we've heard about the smart TV, the set-top box, the personal video recorder, uh, media servers where you still store things, your gaming consoles, be they Wii's or Xboxes. Then you've got all your pads and pods, as I like to call them, depending on what brand you use, your smartphones. Then you've got specialised things in your home. You might have the home health care unit um, that measures your blood pressure automatically and reports it back. Smart metering uh, is becoming very popular, particularly in the cities, um, so you might want to plug into that your home air conditioning system, your security cameras. I know people who have um, security cameras around their home and um, they can log on and watch what's going on in their home from wherever they are in the world. Uh, you may even be able to answer the door remotely when the delivery man comes. Uh, obviously, you want your security alarm connected as well. Uh, a telework unit. Again, we talked about telework. There may be a need for slightly specialised facilities to work from home. And, of course, the Internet of Things that Peter talked about this morning. This is a, uh, an old photo. Um, up the top right hand side is what we were doing in a fibre to the home trial in the Partridge housing estate, which is a housing estate in Sydney a couple of years ago, before the NBN rollout started. They were actually putting fibre to the home. A company called Opticom was doing this one uh, in new housing estates here in Sydney. We did some trials there. Uh, it was a bit clunky. On the left hand side you can see the box that they had to install with battery backup and things like that. Uh, the photo in the middle shows an NBN indoor unit in the Armadale uh, first instalment, so you can have your options as to where you want to put it. Do you want to put it on the outside or the inside? Uh, but it's a slightly different performance. Just being a bit technical, what you get is a network terminating unit, and it comes with four Ethernet ports and an tele old telephone port. So if you want to keep your old telephones, you can just plug it into that. Um, you can use a VoIP provider or a Wi-Fi VoIP phone. But what you get is these four ports coming out of the wall. And they can be for different services. One could be for pay TV. One could be for your health provider. One could be for education. One could be a secure port, if you like a child-friendly port that's um, walled in so the children can't get out into any of the nasty parts of the world. Uh, in shared accommodation, this could be used. Uh, if you're sharing a home with three other people, instead of arguing over the phone bill or the internet bill as it now is, you could have a different port for each person. But what comes to importance there is this, this home gateway is really becoming a very important part of your life. Uh, we use a technology called virtual LANs to do this, and you're all familiar with a LAN. You've got a LAN in your home, a LAN at work. What the technology the NBN uses is called virtual LANs, where they have a uh, special technology that isolates um, the traffic from each of those, but it comes out of the final port. So you may have a home LAN, you may have a home for um, your media, your pay TV operator which they might be called pay TV operators anymore. Uh, you may have one for your education, it only goes to the, the kids' bedroom, and that's the only thing they can connect to, or it may be one for the health service provider. Uh, so that's what the box used to look like in Parkridge, and the new NBN boxes, um, NBN codes, got slightly different uh, versions. So, do you have to rewire the home? There was a lot of fuss created a couple of years ago, people saying, Ah, it's going to be expensive. Not only have you got to get the NBN in, but then you've got to work out what to do around your home. Well, the answer is no, you don't have to rewire the home. There's a number of solutions. The first, obviously, is wireless. 
Um, you can use the existing cables, a lot of them will run at least at 10 megabits per second. Um, you can use the cable as a pull through, just put a better quality cable on it, pull it through. Wi-Fi base stations, um, when I did this slide for a talk a year ago, it was 300 megabits, then it was 450 megabits, and just recently there's a lot of systems advertised for 900 megabits, and these things are a couple of hundred dollars for the top end, and they're $30 for the low end of the range. Wi-Fi extenders, if you've got a house that's a bit big, you can plug one of those in, again, they're less than $50. Or you can use um, my favourite solution that a lot of people forget about, which is Ethernet over power. These adapters here, you plug one into a power point somewhere in the house next to your um, gateway, plug your uh, NBN into that, you plug another one, two or three in other rooms in the house and it sends a signal over your electricity wires. And um, $35 a pair I just saw one advertised for, so it's not exactly expensive. There are also media servers if you like to store lots of, um, uh, lots of movies of your own choice, all your music, uh, and they're built to come with um, uh, Ethernet over power as well. So you can use that to send the videos around the house. The one thing I keep telling to people anywhere, anywhere, is turn on security on your home gateway devices. Don't let anyone sort of just log on and start using your internet or you can get into big trouble if they start doing things illegal. So that's, that's what the home will look like. Uh, there is one problem with wireless, and that's for these poor, feathered friends. Uh, there's no wires, they've got nowhere to sit. So, my comment is, there was a lot of debate, so I've added these slides. Um, I know we're not supposed to be talking too much about the technology, but glass is forever. Uh, that is uh, lacrimatory, which was a tear collector that the Romans used to use to show how sorry they were at a funeral. That was buried in the tomb. Uh, it was dug up by a, a distant relative of mine in 1928. And it's a little bit dirty, a little bit dinged, but glass is forever. Um, I'll give you another example I talked about yesterday. Uh, we're all familiar with the Parkes Radio Telescope. At Narrabri in the 1980s, CSIRO uh, built the Australia Telescope, which I was part of the team doing that. And one of my jobs was to, de to design the optical fibre communication system that communicated between these antennas and one that was slightly distant uh, out there at Kalgoorlie. And we put in a single mode optical fibre over six kilometres. When we installed it, uh, we built electronics that ran at around 600 megabits per second. This was um, 1986, and when I spoke to my friends up there late last year, yep, they were still using that optical fibre, but that was running at 10 gigabits per second now. They just changed the electronics at either end. So um, fibre is forever. Um, I don't even think it's uh, 50 years. I think it's more like 100 at least. So just talking about how fast, um, you know, People talk about what you can put down the optical fibre. Down the trunk roots, people are putting hundreds of gigabits per second down the main trunks that actually go between Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra. They go through Dubbo. The trunks are running multiple wavelengths of 100 gigabits. Uh, the GPON, which is what the, the passive optical network that the NBN is based on, can actually go goes two and a half to 10 gigabits per second and more coming. Uh, the microwave winds, people ask about why not wireless. Well, you can get up to 100 megabits per second, maybe a bit more, but they don't go very far. LTE, the fourth generation wireless, again, it's 100 megabits, but it's shared, it only goes five kilometres. And uh, Wi-Fi um, obviously only goes around the house. To answer Peter's question, I actually looked it up um, this morning. The world record for optical fibre is now 26 terabits per second down one fibre. Uh, that was last year, look what said at um, Carswell, Universe, Carswell Institute of Technology in Germany. So, uh, don't worry about um, running out of bandwidth anytime soon. Uh, just the other thing I want to say is save the radio spectrum for mobile devices. We all want mobile devices, we're all using them. Uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the USA has got a real problem. They call it the spectrum crunch. And when someone asked the chairman, um, someone managed to snap this beautiful photo, how much spectrum is left? That's how much. And he's got a long story about it, um, basically. Um, they're trying to free up more spectrum just for mobile devices, so don't waste it on um, things that can be done with fibre. Okay, I'll now get down to what do you do with all that bit, all that bit rate. Um, rough studies, the eyeball has about 180 million receptors in it, rods and cones. Um, if you look at the um, colour scale, colour depth that we can perceive, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it could be at least you know, 24 bits. 
the frame rate you can see things that move at least you can tell the difference between 50 and 60 frames per second so it's at that so we estimate the bandwidth of an eyeball is about a terabit per second that is the bandwidth that would be needed if you wanted to experience the same sight as going out and looking at some beautiful scenic um, sight around Dubbo as projecting it on a screen. So uh, there's no need to worry about um, what we're going to do with the bandwidth if we want to get that true feeling of being there. Uh, sound, you have people are talking up to 22 channels of surround sound and Pete Balsino again talked about the Internet of Things. So I want to talk a little bit about video. Um, I divide it into three areas. There's non-real-time video, which is what everyone's been talking about, maybe too much, downloading their video. Um, so, you know, just download it overnight, see what's there. Uh, the good thing about that is once it's on your set-top box, you can skip fast-forward it as you will, so you're not going to get any streaming. Then there's real-time, uh, which is uh, looking at things like TV broadcasts, um, real-time events that people like to watch, like MasterChef or X Factor, which are becoming incredibly popular. And then there's interactive, and that's when you're talking face-to-face -face or human-to-human, -human, basically, or human-to-human -human if you're gaming. I'm not sure if you call that human-to-human -human or what. Um, Teenager-to-teenager, -teenager maybe. Uh, these things are very important when you start to get that interactivity, the world changes. The interesting thing is that all the video compression that we use at the moment is dominated by the broadcast um, industry. They had all the money when these standards were being set and they were interested in something that was cheap to decode, cheap in the set-top box, and they didn't mind if it was expensive in their studios. And that's why we have this slightly asymmetric problem with video, and particularly things like MP2. I'm going to very quickly, uh, and I apologise for this, give you a geek's view of video. I'm going to skip through it very quickly, but just to talk through the standards. Standard depth, everyone talks about standard depth. Um, which is what, what we're used to, what we get on free-to-air TV most of the time. 16 by 9 is come out. Um, that's actually raw. Um, if you're using 8 bits for each of the three colours in each pixel, it comes at about 10 megabits per frame. Then you go to high def, and you have some high def content on free-to-air, and there's two versions of that. The most interesting one is the 1080p, which is what I believe the screen is, and um, that comes up five times the sort of... Um, bitrate you've got there. Next generation, uh, a thing called 4K, that's the shorthand that we use to describe it, and um, that's generally referred to as ultra high def. That's four times the resolution of um, high def TV, and it's basically, at raw, it's 200 megabits per frame, 50 frames a second, you're seeing you're getting a lot of bandwidth. In the labs, they've got a thing called 8K, which is, again, uh, twice the size, and that's roughly the detail of IMAX. Dip it into an IMAX theatre. Um, and, again, this is in the lab, but it's going to come to you sometime soon. The 4K screens are now available. Uh, I think you can buy them for around $12,000 if you've got the right sort of DVD player to use that thing. You know, 10 years ago, I said, I'm never going to buy one of those 42-inch plas plasma screens. They're way too expensive. Um, now they're much less than $1,000, so the $10,000 screens are going to come down in a few years' time, we'll all have them. So the bits you need for uncompressed are uh, shown down the bottom there, up to 796 megabits per frame. So what does all that mean? Basically, 